but if you want to learn more about me, please check out the materials under week zero. And feel free to introduce yourself under the introduce yourself prompt. I see a couple of students have done that already. All right, so let's hop right into it. So last week we looked at archaeology in general, and I introduced you to a few of the concepts associated with the discipline. This week, obviously, I want to focus our attention on architecture, the topic of this course. So in terms of learning objectives this week, the first thing I want you to understand is how architecture appears in the archaeological record and the various forms that it takes. I want you to understand the difference between an artifact and a feature, and we'll get into definitions and everything like that as well. And I also want you to know and understand uh, the three Fs, which is going to be my approach to uh, studying architecture and looking at our case studies in the coming weeks. So in terms of questions this week, again, I'm going to have them for you every week. I want you to first think about and keep it in the back of your mind throughout this lecture. When you hear the terms archaeology and architecture together, what comes to mind? Is it a certain building, a famous landmark, etc, etc? Just think about it, keep it there, and uh, see if any of the material I present today compares to that. And then another thing I want you to be thinking about, uh, this is kind of a three-part question here, but what defines architecture? Is every part of a building important, as in the physical elements of the building? And also, is everything that happened to that building and within the context of that building important? Think about that going forward. All right. Architecture and the archaeological record. Now, architecture is obviously an integral part of our everyday lives as humans, and it has been throughout the course of our existence. First, you have this idea of the temporary shelters that were used while we hunted and gathered across landscapes. And then as people became more sedentary, you start to see more permanent structures. And this idea of the home and the nuclear group, which eventually snowballed into architecture being used as a way to display wealth and power. Uh, whether that was in a domestic or a public setting. So through architecture as humans, we began to define our space into uses. And you could say restrict access and provide a strict flow of movement using architecture. Uh, think about, say, a border wall or a city wall, which structurally is fairly simple, but in terms of how it controlled people, very powerful. Now, in the archaeological record, architecture manifests itself in many different ways. And the first thing I want to get to is fragmentary material, which, as I mentioned last week with archaeology, a lot of archaeology is fragmentary. So one of the best examples and most limited examples of how architecture can appear is in the form of a post hole, which is no more than a stain in the dirt, usually, where the organic material once was. And when you get a group of them, you can see the area in which the building once stood, but you have nothing else to go off except where the post holes were. And then obviously moving along with that, we have foundations, uh, like this one from uh, the Roman fort in Cramond, which is a little more substantial than post holes, <laughs> um, but still limited in terms of the information it can give uh, to how the space was used and you know exactly what the space would have looked like. Was it two stories? Was it one story? It's hard to tell for sure, but we can draw comparative analysis with other Roman buildings uh, from many different areas um, across Europe and so on. So in terms, so we get fragments, pieces of buildings that we need to analyze to try and reconstruct what a building was, or at least our individual ideas of what a building may have looked like. And one of the, and I already talked about foundations and post holes, but another good example of how complicated it can be is uh, this example of spolia. Now spolia is Latin for spoils, and it's defined as architectural fragments that are taken from their original context, remember we talked about context last week, to be used in the construction of something new. Now, practically, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, like this example in Syria, you take architectural fragments uh, from other buildings to build, say, a city wall. If you need to build it in a hurry during a time of invasion, or you don't have the resources available to build something, so you just reuse what you already have. 
And then a little more complicated <laughs> is the use of spolia in a setting where it's used as propaganda. And my best example of that is the Arch of Constantine in Rome. And I'll post some additional material um, about this particular arch on Friday, if anyone was interested. So what Constantine did is he reused multiple fragments of past emperor's constructions to build his arch in order to solidify his legitimacy and directly associate himself with these past emperors who were still revered in Rome even uh, decades or centuries after they had uh, died. So, and then of course we have at the other end of the spectrum, beyond fragments, is buildings that are still standing today. Now, this may sound like the easiest kind of building to study, but as you'll see, um, as we explore the case studies especially, this isn't exactly the case. So the thing that was made to control the flow of people and define a space's use is itself restricted in the way we can understand it. So uh, going back to fragmentary pieces, um, I want to just hop into a quick discussion regarding features versus artifacts. And this is terminology you may come across uh, in this field of, of the archaeology of architecture. So although features themselves are technically considered a form of artifact, the definition really comes down to portability. So Renfrew and Bonn define an artifact as portable. So these are objects that have been made, modified, and used by humans. Uh, for example, this model of a beast of burden from the site of Phaistos in Crete. Uh, it was excavated, found, and it now sits in the Heraklion Archaeological Museum, whereas a feature is a non-portable artifact with the same attributes, uh, and the term is often associated with architectural remains, the range of which we just discussed. So a post hole is a feature, a foundation is a feature. Uh, this part of the actual site of Phaistos, which is not in the Heraklion Archaeological Museum because it could not be moved there, uh, the pillar crypt is a feature, the Hagia Sophia is a feature. So occasionally though, you may see architectural fragments that are put on display or partially reconstructed using authentic pieces uh, in the context of the museum. Uh, one example I can think of is the altar of Zeus from Pergamon, which is now in Berlin, or uh, the Acropolis Museum in Athens. So there are architectural fragments in there, sort of reconstructed the best way possible. But this kind of defeats this idea of portability, at least in our modern age. And this is a highly debatable idea, I think, but where do you draw the line between an artifact and feature. Uh, reconstruction itself is an issue we're going to touch on a little bit in lecture six, but just to summarize artifact versus feature, you have artifacts, you have features, and when you have all of them together, you have a site. And that is what helps define uh, this use of space that architecture um, creates, I guess is the best form. Now this brings us into our discussion regarding the three Fs. So for this course, I've decided to simplify approaching uh, this, the question of, of how we study architecture, uh, because architecture as a discipline itself is complicated, and then throwing in the concepts surrounding archaeology that we discussed last week uh, can make it slightly daunting. So I, I present to you the three Fs, uh, form, function, and feeling. Now a quick disclaimer, this isn't a universal criteria. Uh, across the discipline to any extent. It's just my own personal construction, um, and I've loosely based it off ideas from Roth. Um, however, he does use different terminology. Uh, for example, he calls what I've classified as feeling as delight in varying forms, and I don't necessarily agree that architecture always inspires delight, but I'll get into that in the next slide. Now, and the other thing too, these aren't exactly solid definitions that you need to know. They're just kind of the three, a simplified version of the three main points that I want you to think about when you're studying or looking at a built environment or architecture in the archaeological record. So number one is form. 
fairly self-explanatory. You know, what is the building's form? And you can, to go into depth a bit, you can use physical terms to describe something. So, you know, for example, the one I have on the screen is arguably gothic stained glass windows, pointed arches, and you would usually associate that with a church. However, moving over to function, uh, this plays a role in understanding the form of a building sometimes. So this structure is, again, arguably church-like. However, it was once a palace and now it functions as a museum. So fo form and function kind of play into each other a little bit. So you have to kind of look at what is the structure, what was the structure's intended function upon its initial construction, and then also looking at what is its current function, and then right in the middle, has it had multiple functions over time? Why or how has it changed, and has that affected the overall structure of the building? Again, playing into this, has everything that happened to a building, both physically and, you know, historically, is that all important? I would argue yes. Uh, another good example I like to use, actually, which is a little bit simpler than the Ricks Museum, is in my hometown of Canada, there is an old church that was converted into a house. Now, form-wise, from the outside, most people would assume it's a church. It still has the pointed um, arches, the stained glass, the bell tower, but, and even inside, I think some of the pews, but the space now is used as a domestic space. So does that mean that its form has changed along with its function, or could you still argue that its form is, you know, ecclesiastical, not domestic? Just something to think about. And obviously form and function kind of play into each other a little bit, whereas feeling, our uh, next F, uh, kind of sits apart on its own. Now, feeling. <laughs> Slightly more complicated one, and the main question associated with this F is a two-parter. So what sort of feeling does the building give you as an individual, and what was its intended universal message? So a good example of this, uh, the gargoyles in the architecture on the exterior of Gothic cathedrals during the High Middle Ages were meant to act as a reminder to the primarily illiterate masses to fear God as they entered the cathedral. And then the way the acoustics worked, the way the stained glass changed the light in the interior was meant to act as a celebration of his glory. So the architecture itself created a barrier between the profane, unclean, unholy world outside the church to the sacred, clean, holy inside of the church where you could come and speak to God, where God lived. Uh, and that is... These are the feelings it would have instilled in Christians, in people who had these beliefs. But what about someone from a different religion coming to the cathedral? Uh, they may be impressed by the architecture and the art, so that awestruck feeling is there. But it isn't going to instill any feelings associated with their personal religion because they have different practices, different ways of defining their sacred space. So again, some feelings may be fairly universal, but it ultimately comes down to the individual when we talk about feeling and architecture. So another good way to think about it is you are comfortable in your own space, in your own home. But when someone else comes into your, into your home, they may be impressed by the space, but it means less to them because it isn't theirs. And maybe it even makes them uncomfortable because it is not familiar. And this may affect how they act in the space versus how you would act in the space. And think about restrictions and everything as well. You know, a locked door, that's a pretty physical barrier. But going back to the church, the physical barriers are not necessarily as present, but the social barriers are. So for example, someone attending the church wouldn't stand behind the altar where the priest is giving mass. They wouldn't go into the inner rooms of the church at all. Uh, they physically could, because there's nothing physically stopping them, but socially they aren't going to do that because of the feelings the architecture instills and the way the space has been defined hierarchically. 
and socially. So coming off of feeling and the three Fs, I know that was a little bit dense. If you need more clarification, I'm happy to answer more questions on Google Classroom. But how do we study a building? You know, and compare it like we would study, say, an artifact or, you know, a site, like a buried site. How do we approach a building, a standing building? Sometimes we never get the chance to actually fully understand everything that's happened to a building and all of its phases, because if it's still in use, we only see the most recent layer. Uh, and you can't see the other layers without destroying that outer layer, which may still be important to someone in the current time. We'll get into that a little bit when we uh, start talking about the Hagia Sophia. And remember, archaeology is destructive. So we record as we go, but we destroy as we go as well. So sometimes a building can only be physically studied and all of its phases completely understood when it's no longer viable. You can look at, say, old building plans, old photos, and stuff like that, but it's not the same as actually physically seeing those changes or seeing those phases in person because, you know, secondary sources aren't necessarily as reliable. So how do we study a building? I want to introduce you to the idea of the palimpsest. Now, a palimpsest usually refers to something in literature. Uh, for example, a piece of parchment that has been written on multiple times um, over the course of history. So someone wrote something, they erased it, wrote it again, and so on and so forth. But the remains of those earlier writings are still there. Obviously, this has a more universal application that is very applicable to architecture. So something reused or altered, but still bearing visible traces of its earlier form. I think it's a good idea to approach a building specifically in the same way. So when you go to inside a building, you only see the most recent layer uh, in each place, in each area of the building, right? So some things in the building never change from its first construction. Sometimes only select things change and people just keep reusing what was already there. And sometimes everything changes. You know, nothing is as it originally was, and you only get fragments, maybe if even that, of its original construction and its older layers in the most recent layer. And the very, you like to believe that the various phases of the building remain for the most part, they're just hidden. But just like any sort of archeological site, sometimes the more recent layers destroyed a good chunk of the older layers, if not all of them. So again, there's that those missing pieces of information, but we try to discern as much as we can from what we do have when we have the chance to, I guess, dissect the building. So a couple of good examples of this, I think, are wallpaper and layers of wallpaper. So, you know, you have the original layer of wallpaper that was put up and instead of tearing it down, people just kept putting wallpaper over and so as you start to rip the layers back you can see how it progressed over time and sometimes date it uh, stylistically. Uh, another good example <laughs> that I'm sure some of you would be familiar with would be when people put carpet over really nice hardwood so you know or maybe a certain they put like a glaze over the hardwood and then the carpet and then maybe there's another layer even on top of that but as you peel it back, you see those phases and maybe you can date them based on the material that was used and so on and so forth. So the only difference in comparison to, you know, the literary palimpsest versus the architectural palimpsest, as I've already kind of mentioned a little bit, is that you can only see these deposits, these layers, these phases when you destroy the most recent. And again, as I mentioned in the last slide, Sometimes those recent layers are really important to people. So coming off the three Fs and the idea of the palimpsest, which are all fairly easily relate, uh, related to each other, uh, as we'll see with the site of Malta next week, sometimes we don't have a definitive answer to any of our three Fs, and that's where archaeology and interpretation really comes into play. Uh, sometimes we take one phase from our palimpsest and we use it for tourism purposes, propaganda, 
politics. And we'll see that a little bit with the Parthenon. And then sometimes uh, the form remains, a good chunk of the art remains, but the function changes, uh, mainly in association with religion. And the sacred space uh, continues to be used as a sacred space, but differently. And we'll see that with the Hagia Sophia. So obviously, this is a very basic rundown. I also have the dates posted here, so it gives you kind of an idea of the range we're going to be looking at. Uh, but we're going to get into more details in the coming weeks. So thank you so much, everyone. Just a couple of reminders and looking forward. So quiz will be posted tomorrow. Uh, additional materials I'll post on Friday. And if you wanted uh, more information regarding any of the material I covered this week, um, I'll be happy to post that as well uh, any other day of the week at any time throughout this course. And so next week's topic, we're looking at the Giganthia Temple in Malta, uh, and we'll be talking about its historical context and applying the three Fs in the archaeological record. Uh, these were my sources this week, if you wanted to take a gander at any of them. And thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you next week. Uh, please remember, if you have any questions, to check the FAQs. And remember that all assignments are going to be due two weeks after the final week. Uh, however, I do recommend you complete them as we go along here. It'll definitely help with the learning process. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.